Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. So, first of all, thank you very much to everybody that's asked any questions. Uh, this whole thing lives and dies by you asking questions. If you don't ask questions, there's no Q&A. So, thank you. Secondly... Please don't forget that I answer these questions normally on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Today's, well, I'm doing a watch on. Today's Tuesday afternoon, so uh, if you want to guarantee to get these question answer, questions answered, then try to get them in by sort of the beginning of Tuesday. If I miss it, I'm sorry, just ask it on the following Q&A and I will try and get to it then. Um, I also don't actually prep for these Q&As, I just literally look at the question and answer it for you. Uh, so you're getting kind of my raw, unfiltered opinion. And then if there's any questions that I think are kind of appropriate for a meatier type of video, I'll carry those onto a future video down the line. With that all being said, I've had a quick flick through. There's a ton of questions, which is always a good sign. Uh, so let's see what we've got this week. Let's get cracking with this week's Q&A. Okay, so the first question is from MS Krim, who says, Hey, Craig, I know poker size cards are popular. Uh, but are there any magic dealers you know that sell bridge size cards for those with smaller hands? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, most dealers will sell bridge size cards. I know Alakazam had them when I went to uh, Alakazam last week. I've seen Prop Dog carry them. I'm pretty sure Penguin and Vanishing Ink will have them as well. It's kind of a common thing. You can get bridge, bridge size cards from most magic dealers. Um, one thing I will say, though, is don't worry too much about the size of your hands. You know, I think that um, poker size cards are fairly easy to handle. Ryland uses poker size cards, for example, um, you know, and he can do most slights with cards that he needs to do. Uh, can't do an, uh, an early days change, but I don't think he can do one with a bridge size pack anyway. So, yeah, don't worry too much about the size of the cards. That won't affect most slights. But if you do want to use bridge size cards, that's fine. You can get them from most magic dealers. OK, so the next question is from Darren Brain and Darren says, question. Hi, Craig. I've seen a few videos of you recently doing some different invisible purse effects, which are great. Thanks, buddy. I do a lot of stuff with purse frames. I love that prop pretty much more than anything. Uh, do you know I have searched myself but with no joy if it's possible to buy a purse, which is completely normal, but the frame of it matches those used for the invisible purse style effects. I don't really think that there is one, but you know, I remember seeing a Curtis Cam video years ago. And what Curtis Cam did is he uh, made a purse frame out of a real purse. So what he did is he took a real purse and just cut away the actual bag and he left some bits of material. And his presentation was, this is a this is a uh, a frame that has been ripped from a bag. So you could do that. I mean, all a purse frame is, is it's genuinely uh, the frame of a purse. So if you got yourself uh, a couple of purses that you want to use that are the right size and the right shape for what you want to do with it, just cut the bag off one of them, leave the other one as is, and then you've got a purse frame that matches a purse with a bag absolutely flawlessly that's probably what i'd do that's probably the best way to go with that darren okay so the next question is from philip austin and philip says hi craig thanks for all the time and effort you put into our magical community no problem it's so sad harry lorraine didn't make it to 100 years a sad loss i completely agree on that what is harry's effect out of this universe is it the same as out of this world that it's similar and I think a lot of people compare Out of This Universe to Out of This World, but it's slightly different. With Out of This World, the Paul Curry Out of This World effect, the idea is that the, the spectator is sorting the cards. So the deck is mixed up, they go through the cards, they decide whether it's red or black, and at the end of the effect, you show that it's completely... Um, it's completely uh, separated. The, major, the spectator did it themselves. Without this universe, uh, a few people have criticised it in the past, and I really like the effect. A few people have criticised it, and I think the reason is they think it's too procedural, which I can understand, but it's not the same effect as out of this world. It's kind of um, a, a very different thing. The idea is that despite the spectator dealing and the magician constantly shuffling and then the spectator dealing and the magician constantly shuffling, despite all of that, the cards are able to sort themselves out into red and black. So it's a very different premise. 
Um, it's a great premise. I've seen some amazing performances of Out of This Universe, but it's very different to Out of This uh, World. It's similar in some ways, but it's also very, very different. But it's a great trick. It's well worth learning, if only to understand Harry's approach to this plot. Okay, so the next question is again from Darren Bain, and Darren says... Oh, sorry, not Darren Bain, Philip Austin. And Philip says, uh, Mnemonica, is 24 the 10 of spades or the 10 of clubs? I've seen both being used. Thanks, keep magic alive, Phil. Uh, it's the 10 of clubs. I went through a period of time a few years back where I actually mixed it up in my head and I just went on with it uh, and then switched it back about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, yeah, the, the 24 is the 10 of clubs. 34 is the 10 of spades. So that's the... Uh, that's the position of the two cards. So, yeah, definitely 24 is the 10 of clubs. If you hear it the other way around, that's not how Mnemonica or the Tamarit stack was originally developed. It was developed for the 24th card being the 10 of clubs. Okay, so the next question is from Sean McNulty, Magician. Hey, Sean, hope you're well. And Sean says, hi, Craig. Thanks for breaking down my routine. Thought I'd throw another routine at you and let, uh, and let me know your thoughts. Thanks very much. So his routine is, and by the way, anybody else that wants me to do this with their set lists, just send them over, put them in the comments down below. Um, so what we've got here, so we've got Turbo Stick, first of all, uh, followed by Stand Up Monty, and then uh, finishing off with Imagination or Imagine by Harry and Peter Nardi or The Invisible Deck. Um, so, right, okay, so, and you've put here after Turbo Stick, transition into house skills as a magician you can use to scam people. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, right? Okay, so Turbo Stick is, uh, or the way that Richard Sanders does Turbo Stick is, hey, you're going to see if we're going to play a little game with a stick and, and uh, three crosses, and you're going to have to see if you can actually work out uh, what's what, and obviously the spectators constantly get it wrong. Um, so the logical transition into Stand Up Monty is talking about how magicians can scam people. Um, that makes total sense. Yes, absolutely, 100%. That makes total sense. I think that the hook line for the set would need to revolve around that. I think it would have to revolve around something along the lines of, hey, so I've been a professional magician for many, many years. And because of that, I've developed a series of skills that actually allow me to cheat people. Now, I would never do that because... Obviously, I'm a magician, I'm not a scam artist, but I'd like to show you how I can actually use those school skills to manipulate how you think and manipulate a game of chance so it doesn't become chance, it actually becomes a foregone conclusion. You then go into Turbo Stick and then, you, and then the transition would be, as you can see, I was able to constantly be one step ahead of you. And even though you thought you knew the answer, I was able to prove that you weren't. Now, that was just magic. That was me using sleight of hand. But when I see people, uh, when, uh, when, I, when I show people that, people say to me, well, how, that's, how is that really relevant to games of chance? Because it's not a playing card. It'd be a bit weird if you pulled out a stick like this, which is why I'm now going to show you how you can adapt those skills to playing cards. Um, and, then, and then you'd bring out Stand Up Monty and you do Stand Up Monty. And at the end of Stand Up Monty, all of the cards have turned queens or jacks or whatever you're using, and you put the cards away. Now you need to transition into Imagine or you need to transition into Invisible Deck. For me, and you said here, I'm not too sure on the transition. For me, the transition to the Invisible Deck would be about influencing people. So what I would do is at the end of Stand Up Monty, I would say, now I've shown you twice now how I'm able to cheat you in a game of chance. Now, you're probably wondering how I was able to do that. Was it sleight of hand? Was it the hand moving faster than the eye? Well, really, it was just my ability to influence you and therefore have you go in one direction rather than another. You felt like you had a free choice. You felt like you knew exactly what you were choosing and you felt like I didn't influence you at all, but I did influence you. And I'm going to prove that to you right now. I've got a deck of cards here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around. I'm going to turn one card over in this deck. And one card I'm going to turn over, I think it's going to be, I'm going to try and influence you to pick that card. Now, you're going to feel like you've got a free choice, but I'm ultimately going to influence you to go down the route that I want you to go down. And this is basically the same thing that I was doing with the stick and with the three cards, but we're using a, an entire pack of cards now. So I've turned one card over. You take the deck. 
I'm going to see if I can influence you. And then you go through this whole process of, hey, think a card, pick a card, pick a number card. You know, what would you like pictures or numbers? Would you like a, what? You go through, make more of a deal of the selection process. And rather than doing it as an invisible deck presentation, you can even say to them, like, did you feel like you've got a free choice? Did you feel that that was a completely free choice of card? I didn't influence. But what if I can prove to you I did influence you because I turned one card over in this deck for the first time what was the name of your card that's how I would that's how I'd transition from stand-up Monty into the invisible deck by by talking about the application of the skills that you've shown them up until that point as a magician and the ability to influence people and then say hey the thing is that you know a lot of the time when you see a magic trick it's not really a magic trick it's the same thing as you just saw a scam artist or a con artist do but i'm applying it in a different direction now in order for that presentation to make sense you'd have to be the sort of person that's happy to go down that route and not pretend that magic's real but as long as you don't pretend magic's real that's probably the route that i'd go down with that now if you wanted to transition into imagine you could do the same sort of thing, but with a twist. So if you're going into Imagine, you'd start the same way. So you'd say, well, how are these skills applicable to a magician? Well, when a magician has you pick a card and, and look at a card, the reason they can tell you what the card is, is because they can read you. All I'm doing with these games of chance is I'm reading you. I'm anticipating the choices that you're going to make. I'm studying body language i'm studying which way you walk which way you talk i'm studying all of that and i'm able to then anticipate the decisions you make and make sure that i'm one step ahead of you we can apply that to a card trick as well and i can have you pick a card and just by looking at what you're doing i can tell you what the card is let me give you an example i've got a deck of cards here and they've all got different backs that's not important that i collect cards this is my card collection it's the faces that are important say stop look at that card have you got it you have fantastic now i want you to look at me and, and i want you to lie to me and tell me the name of any other card in the deck not your card, any other card in the deck. So they do that and you go, okay, interesting. Did you see how when he did that, he looked to the left slightly. He looked to the left slightly and and, and he didn't say that card very loudly. Now that tells me, uh, you know, that tells me it's completely different to the card that you named. So that tells me that uh, you picked a diamond, so it would be a club. Uh, you picked a, you named a picture card, it would be a number card. So I think that you went for this. And, and do that a couple of times. Um, which you can do with Imagine, and then say at the end, and then the reason for the deck turning blank is, so you're probably wondering, is there such thing as magic? You know, I've just shown you how I can take skills that I've learned cheating people at games of chance, and I can apply it to a pack of cards and make it look like I'm reading your mind, whilst in reality I'm using a combination of body language and influence. Is magic real? Well, yeah, of course. Of course magic's real. But if you want to see what a magic trick would look like, it would look something like this. Remember, we've had this deck of cards here the whole time. If I just do this, boom, every single card turns blank. That's not influence. That's not body language. I think the only thing you could use to describe that is real magic. And you've got that. That's how I would justify going into the blank deck thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a great set. It's, it really is a great set. Uh, I think it works really, really well. I think you just need to get that hook line at the beginning to the whole set. Uh, make sure that hook line is strong, get the transitions in between routines going, and um, and I think that could be a really strong set. Yeah, there you go. Hope that helps, Sean. Okay, so the next question is from Phil K 77 and Phil K 77 says, do you know where I can purchase baby gag cards or posters from? I want to use them as part of Digital Force Bag. Well, my effect gossip from Alakazam came with five different baby gag cards. Uh, with babies on one side and pictures of celebrities on the other. You might be able to get refills from Alakazam. It's a question for them, not for me. Um, one of the most popular versions of the baby gag is uh, Smart Arse, Celebrity Smart Arse by Bill Abbott. And he sells on his website lots of different refills for lots of his tricks. So he might have refills for celebrities. It would be worth looking there and seeing if there's any baby gags. But to be honest, I've done baby gag for years on stage. Don't do it anymore. Do something different. But I've done it for a very, very long time. And uh, when I was doing it regularly, I made my own and I gave it out. So I used it as an opener and uh, I just made my own. So I just literally went to a um, printer. I went to my local printer and I said, hey, I want a picture of this celebrity. I want an A3 or an A4 piece of paper. I want a picture of the celebrity on one side. I want a baby on the other side. Can you do that for me? And I ordered 50 of them. 
and um, that's why I, it was A3. It was A3, and I folded it in half. That's right. So you had a baby on both sides, and then when you opened it up, inside was the celebrity they thought of. And I just had like fifty or a hundred of those printed. And every single time I went to a show, uh, it was Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise my force. So I'd end up by giving the spectator that I was performing for the picture of Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise, give, actually giving it to them to keep. Um, saying, hey, hey, you can have that as a souvenir and put it up on your bedroom wall. You're welcome. And so I just made my own up and it was relatively cheap. I think it was like 20 quid for the design and the print. Nice glossy um, paper and it looked fantastic. So I would make your own and give them away as souvenirs if I were you. Okay, so the next question is Phil K 77 again. And he says, please, can you recommend a resource to learn 21st century Phantom? Oz Perlman's version doesn't seem to be available anywhere. It's a download, isn't it? Yeah, download. You can get the actual um, 21st Century Phantoms from... Um, uh, you can get the 21st Century Phantom cutouts from Prop Dog. Prop Dog do a lot of them. Uh, but I sure I thought it was a download. Is it not? No, it's not. Oh, my gosh. There you go. Didn't know. Um, so no, I don't know anywhere to be perfectly honest. Um, I would check with Prop Dog because they made a big deal of the 21st Century Phantoms. They produced like a massive line of 21st Century Phantoms. Um, so I would suggest that maybe they would be the guys to go for. They have got their own section on there of 21st Century Phantom by Prop Dog. Um, I don't know, but I would suggest Prop Dog would be a good place to start looking. I imagine that they, and they do have um, the mixed packs in at Prop Dog. So uh, maybe they will do it. I'm not too sure. I'd start with, uh, I'd start with Prop Dog. Send an email to Prop Dog. See if they can help you. If not, they'll probably be able to point you in the right direction. Might be worth sending an email to, um, uh, to Penguin as well because they did have the rights to Oz Perlman's 21st Century Phantom. Uh, so if it's not available on Penguin as a DVD, they might be planning to do an upload of that, uh, you know, re-bring it out as a, as a download. I know they've done that in the past, so it might be worth looking into that. So the next question is from Stephen Peters and Stephen says, Hi Craig, hey Stephen, I was wondering, are you still planning on releasing that lottery effect you shared in your Vanishing Ink Masterclass? Yes, definitely. In fact, I spoke to Sean at Penguin about that about a week ago and he is 100%, they are 100% on track to bring it out. I'd like to see it come out this year. It was filmed last year. The problem with uh, every single magic producer I've ever worked with is things take so long, take so long. It's a nightmare sometimes. Um, but yes, it will be coming out at some point. Um, and, uh, I, 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 I'm going to Penguin, uh, in about a week or two to do some more filming. And I believe that, um, um, they might have proofs of the deck for me when I go over there. So watch this space. I'll let you know when I know. Okay. So the next question is from Curtis, uh, Weens and Curtis says, Hey Craig, thanks for taking the time to do these Q and A's. No problem at all. Question. When doing walk around with sponge balls, how do you carry them? Does one need to worry about misshapen sponge balls if they're squished in a position too long? Um, what you tend to find with sponge balls, right, is they do get a bit squished, but a little bit of water will revitalize them very, very quickly. So if I'm planning on doing sponge balls at a walk around gig, what I'll do is I'll take the balls. This is going to sound terrible. I'll take the balls. I'll nip into the toilet and I'll just gently like give them a bit of a gentle tap, switch it on. Uh, very, very drippy, like not gushing. Just put the balls under there. Let the water get into them wash them, give them a couple of seconds to dry off, um, and then they'll be as good as new. And you can put them into your pocket then, and they'll be lasting fine for the duration of a gig. They won't get misshapen anytime soon. So that's what I would do when I get to a gig. I'd freshen my balls up. <laughs> that's because it sounds terrible. When you go to the gig, freshen your balls up, and then put them in your pocket, and they'll be good to go for the rest of the gig, and just get into the habit of doing that when you get to the gig. Um, and in terms of where do I carry them, I just carry them in my trouser pocket, my right hand trouser pocket or left pocket, depending on the routine that I'm doing. OK, so the next question is from David Blaine. And David says, the Queen's nose, are they going to make these coins for other countries and come up with different stories? I think he has another effect out now with the Queen or the King. Yeah, you're talking about the King's Secret, uh, the Noble 52, uh, which is a fantastic version of the trick. I don't know if they're going to come up with a, 
uh, a version for the countries. I could see it working with some sort of uh, dead president and, 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 and having an American version. But to be honest, I, I personally think that the either the Queen's nose or the King's secrets would both work in different countries. I think it's intriguing. When I work here in the UK, I bring out half dollars and dollars and people are intrigued to look at them and see what they are and see what they do and i think you'll have that same thing if you bring out this hey have you heard in england the coronating a queen a king, a king uh the king's coronation would you like to have a look at this my friend sent it me from england it's actually uh, a coronation coin for a king. whatever you want to do whatever presentation i think it would actually be more interesting in another country if you actually bought that coin out or at least that's my experience from using american coins here in the uk Okay, so the next question is from Keith Wolf, and Keith says, where can I get clear Omni Morgans? I've only found 50s and quarters. Also, as far as downloads go, Carl Pennell just dropped one on Penguin today. I haven't been this excited by downloading quite some time. Yeah, I hear uh, good things about Kyle's download. I'm going to get it at some point soon and review it. In terms of the clear Morgans, uh, Calyx was the company, I believe, that uh, produced them. They sold those things through Penguin. Um, but they had their own website. Uh, let's see if we can find it. Calyx Coins, because they're out of stock on Penguin now. I think they put them in, um, uh, I think they put them in Penguin, but um, I think that they have their own site, uh, Omni Coins. Calyx Omni Coins, uh, trying to find it. Bear with, bear with. Uh, no, 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 no. Ah, here we go. There we go. So, there's a website, I believe, if it's still operational. Yes, it is. Uh, it's in French, but you can change it to English. English below. And they are in stock. Fantastic. So, what you have here, the website is... L E P R E S T I dot F R. So that's L for Lima, E for Echo, P for Papa, R for Romeo, E for Echo, S for Sierra, T for Tango, I for India dot F R. And they have in stock Morgan, uh, Chinese, Eisenhower, Kennedy, uh, Franks, Walking Liberties, Euros, Poker Chips. They've got a whole bunch of stuff there. Uh, and they've also got stretched coins and things like that. Um, they've got a load of see-through stuff. Wow, it's omni heaven here, as far as I can see. There's a ton of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's a French website, uh, but they do worldwide shipping, and they ship to the UK. They've got uh, Eisenhower. They've got a jumbo coin. That's quite a cool one. They've got a jumbo clear coin, a clear jumbo coin. Um, and they've got stretched coins in jumbo as well. So they've got a load of stuff, an absolute load of stuff. Oh, look at that stretched coin. Looks like, The stretched Morgan dollar looks amazing. Might even get one of those myself. Um, so yeah, that's that's where you want to go. It's uh, that website. It's by a company called Calyx. And they have pretty much everything and they're engraved and they look beautiful. So I would go there and check those out. Okay, so the next question is from Boba Luna. And Boba Luna says, thank you for your time and devotion to magic and to all answer all of our questions. You're more than welcome. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. For someone who has the Apparition coin set, the Mirrors coin set, and all three coin magic academies from Alakazam, which routines are the must learn first? I'm a beginner coin magician. We'll start with the first academy. Start with the first academy because there's a lot of stuff in there that's almost self-working. It's very, very easy. So start with the first Coin Magic Academy whilst at the same time looking at Apparition because Apparition has some very, very easy stuff on it. There's routines you can do with Apparition that don't even require any palming. Um, so have a look at Apparition. Have a look at the Coin Magic Academy Volume 1 and then progress on to Mirage and look at some of the stuff from Mirage. A nice, easy routine to start with is the, uh, is the Coin Assembly. And then maybe you can then progress from there onto, um, uh, onto the Coin Magic Academy Volume 2 and the Coin Magic Academy Volume 3. 
So yeah, that's 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 the order I'd do it in. I'd start with if you're brand new to magic, coin magic, I'd start with the first coin magic academy and apparition at the same time. Start with those. Those two are the most accessible products, but then go into Mirage and then number two and then number three. And thank you very much for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Okay, so the next question is from Adrian Sutter. And Adrian says, I love picture postcards. I own a ton of them. It'd be great to do magic with them. Are you aware of any picture postcard tricks or have you got any ideas? My own first idea was a memorized stack, but there must be more possibilities. Looch has something with postcards that he uh, um, he published. I reviewed this. It's really good. Um, uh, I can't remember what it's called. But Looch has something really cool with uh read my mind there we go okay let me see if I can. i'm just looking on his website um while i'm looking on his website there was a john bannon trick that came out recently that was really good um that used a um uh from penguin it was a penguin magic eric did eric tate did the tutorial we reviewed that as well but it, it really good and it used a postcard hawaiian punch i think it was called from memory um that was really good and also it, it, don't forget places that's it places um there we go places that's the one um places yeah uh you get a set of custom set of forcing postcards allowing you to perform a three-phase routine that luch has been using to for years to audiences across the uk yeah it's really good places by luch go to readmymind.co.uk that's where you want to go to check out Luch's stuff. He's a great guy. Uh, go check out his interview on Magic TV if you haven't already done so. Uh, but L Luch, uh, go check out his stuff. Um, he's got a couple of things with postcards. And yeah, David Roth, uh, don't forget that when he originally published the Stonehenge Coin Assembly, he used postcards and, and then had the production of the rock at the end, which was just an amazing routine. If you haven't seen the Stonehenge Coin Assembly, by David Roth. Go and check it out. It's a great use of postcards in, in coin magic. Um, I, I, I'd need to think through. I'm sure there's more stuff with postcards, but I can't really think of anything right now. But I'll get back to you. But off the top of my head, the Looch thing, Hawaiian Punch on Penguin from John Bannon, and the Stonehenge Coin Assembly, they're the three that spring instantly to mind. Okay, so the next question is from the Unswattable Midge. Great name. <laughs> Hello, Craig. Not sure if this is the place to ask this question, but I'll take my chances. I'm trying to find a bicycle deck that I last saw around three or four years ago, but I can't remember the name of the deck. The deck consists of 52 cards and jokers. The back design of all of the cards is the same as the front of the bicycle box. Trying to find this has been really niggling me, so any help from your mega brain <laughs> would be gratefully received. Thanks for the great vids. A deck consists of 52 cards and jokers. The back design of all the cards is the same as the front of the bicycle box. That is, yeah. Cosmo bought this out. Cosmo from Real Magic Magazine. It wasn't the Cosmo trick, though. It was Garrett Thomas. And it was called... It's a great trick. It was called... You had a bonus colour-changing deck routine in there. It was better than the main trick. Uh, God. Mash pack. Mash pack, mash pack. Let's do a search, shall we? Uh, Garrett Thomas Mash Pack. There you go, Garrett Thomas Mash Pack. Bada boom, bada bing. Here it is. There's a link to Penguin. God bless you, Penguin. Let's have a look and see what's going on here. Out of stock. Um, Garrett's Mash Pack is a radical reinvention of the beloved bicycle deck. It's a one-of-a-kind breakthrough that mashes a pack and a box into a wonderful magical object. You're holding a solid bicycle card case. The case instantly morphs into 52 single cards. Um, as you square these single loose cards, they visibly morph back into a solid case. You look down um, uh, and see a solid case in your hand. Yeah, uh, Garrett entertains himself using Mash Pack transformations over and over again. They have the same combination. Where's the flap? There's no flap. Where's the ditch? Um, includes routines that leaves you with a normal, regular deck and case. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And it came with a Paul Harris trick. PH box back deck. 
uh, free custom. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's it. Yep, definitely. Mash pack, Garrett Thomas. Uh, it's a great trick. In fact, I've got it somewhere. I should, I should do that as a hidden gem. That's what I'll do. I used to do that for years in restaurant work. It's a great trick. It's definitely one you're looking for. There's a trailer on there, so go check out Mash Pack by Garrett Thomas. Uh, there's a link. Uh, you can you can find it on Penguin and Vanishing Ink. Okay, so the next question is from Tom Gibbons, and Tom says, "Hi, Craig. Hope you're doing well." Uh, question: What is your biggest tip for learning coin magic? Um, my biggest tip for learning coin magic is never give up. Uh, I meet so many people that want to do coin magic, but they don't. They give up. And I understand why. It's more difficult than... than I've talked about this before. I'm not going to dwell on this now. But card magic, the reason it's so popular for new people that are getting into magic is because card magic has instant gratification to it. There are a million self-working tricks where you can literally just learn the trick and immediately, immediately go out and perform it. And there's no skill, there's no moves. You just need to remember a sequence. It's why there's so many YouTube videos out there. Just, you know, hey, learn this self-working trick. Learn this trick right now. It's because there's so many self-working tricks. With coin magic... You don't have that. You have to learn to hold a coin secret in your hand. There's very few tricks in coin magic where you don't have to hold a coin secretly in your hand. And because of that, it makes it more difficult. Um, and because it's more difficult, less people stick at it. They... You know, they have the best intentions. Right, I'm going to learn coin magic. What have I got? I've got the net tricks. I've got all of Craig's slights. Right, I'm going to go through the slight section. Or they take metal by, you know, um, Eric Jones, an illusionist. Or they, they open up the, you know, whatever. There's a million different ways of learning coin magic. But they open it up, they've got a coin. And then it's very much a case of, oh, right, okay, this is actually quite hard. Oh, right, okay. Let's just do another card trick. So I think the biggest piece of advice I can give you when it comes to coin magic is never give up. It's my mentor um, always said to me, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's not easy. Not everybody does it. And if you can stay the course and you can actually, um, you know, practice and get good at it, you'll have a skill which will help you sail head over heels over a lot of other magicians. Because very few people really in the grand scheme of it do coin magic and there's so many skills that you learn as a coin magician that you can apply to every other facet of magic so yeah never give up okay so the next question is from mike tyson by tko and mike says i appreciate your honesty rank ranking your own tricks you're more than welcome like you said it's almost like choosing between two kids between your kids not easy you mentioned about your future products and how they probably make it to the rankings can you give us a teaser or two please we all promise to stay quiet. I've got a video coming up soon. Uh, I just need to film it. And it's my 2023 release schedule. And these things can never be followed because obviously it's impossible. Uh, but it's, it's the tricks that I anticipate coming out between now and the end of 2023 from the various different companies and a little sneak peek of what they all are. So that video is coming soon. I'm going to blow my load on here i'm gonna i'm gonna do a proper video on it um but i'm hoping to get that video out this week okay so the next question again is from mike tyson by tko refills dude you did it again i love locking lotto more each day just for shits and giggles i went to the penguin twice and saw that they now have refills 15 dollars for 10 performances that's fantastic it went from four dollars performance to one dollar fifty i've picked up several refills so i'm set for a while now thanks we're in a better place because of you dude I think that Lucky Lotto has flown under the radar a little bit for a couple of different reasons, one of which is the refill thing. I worked with Penguin very closely to get the refills out as soon as possible. We actually have got some other ideas with that, which we're going to be talking about when I fly over to Penguin. But yeah, I, I love Lucky Lotto and it kills in the real world. It absolutely kills. People just don't see it coming. Um, and yeah, the refills make it very, very affordable, I think. So um you know, for anybody watching this, if you want to pick up some refills and you want to pick up Lucky Lotto, maybe you're held off because uh, of the re the lack of refills. They're now there. They're now available, and you can uh, you can pick up refills and you can you can do the trick over and over again. I think it's one of the best openers if you're going to be doing strolling mentalism. Uh, it's a great opener. Bank Night is a great plot anyway, but it just makes sense to put it into a scratch card right I don't, it's one of those things where i'm really surprised that other people didn't do it before me um but it's it's a killer routine i uh i love it 
Okay, so the next question again is from Agent Suter, and Agent says, you say that some of the best magicians are amateurs and hobbyists. Could you name a few? By the way, a five by five of the best tricks created by amateur magicians would be great. I'm actually doing a few videos coming up about tricks by amateur magicians, the best amateur magicians, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but people that spring instantly to mind are people like um, Guy Hollingsworth. He's an amateur. Um, I define amateur as somebody who... Uh, you know, they, 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 anybody who's got a job, um, and then does magic as well, I think they're a hobbyist, you know, and, and, and if you see my video, I don't mean that in any negative way at all. I genuinely do think some of the best magicians in the world are hobbyists. And I've said this before on the channel, but when you start to rely on magic as an income source, you have to take, um, certain compromises when it comes to the magic that you perform but let's talk about people that i think are amazing that don't have magic as their full-time job guy hollingsworth um springs to mind will houston uh, is a great coin magician as far as i'm aware he is also uh, a hobbyist in so far that he doesn't actually um uh, i don't know but i don't think he does um you've got uh, john bannon obviously james keatley uh, is somebody whose name uh, is very current at the moment. Uh, Chris Congreve is another example of somebody who's not full-time uh, and yet is an amazing magician. Rich Relish uh, is another example of somebody who is not full-time and yet is absolutely killing it. Uh, I'm going to make a big list of people, uh, but I, I think the most important thing to understand is you don't have to be a full-time magician to be an incredible creator in this industry. So the next question is from Pete Booth, and Pete says, what do you think of Alec Kirk's musical tribute to you, and will you be doing a song in return? I've just seen it. I have never laughed so hard in my life. It is possibly the greatest video that has ever appeared on YouTube, ever. Like, I freaking love it, and it made my day when I saw it earlier on today. Uh, will I do a song in return? Absolutely not. Not in any way, shape or form. Nobody wants to hear my singing voice. It's terrible. It's awful. I'm not going to subject it on anybody. But I would like to stay right now on Magic TV. I really appreciate Alex. That was an amazing thing. It really brightened up my day. So thank you very much. And if you guys haven't seen it, go and check out Alex's musical tribute. Uh, it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. So the next question is from Colin Ryder, and Colin says, Hi, Craig. Hi, Colin. Uh, some time ago, you gave me advice on tricks for my four-year-old granddaughter. All went well, and thank you for that. She's now making items vanish for her nan. However, she does not use misdirection that well, as she puts the item up her jumper before showing her empty hands. Not great. My question is, after seeing Ryland do Dusty on the review show, at what age did he start doing sponge balls? I'm thinking of teaching it to my granddaughter. She'll be coming five this week um this week regards colin he started doing it at the age of three three i think he started doing coin magic at the age of two and started doing sponge balls at the age of three so five would be absolutely fine um i've got a video somewhere i'll see if i can include i'm going to put a video hopefully there will be a video playing after this little section here of ryland doing it i think he was uh six maybe five or six in this video um and it was when he was learning about routining things together and learning about how to routine tricks together and it's him doing sponge balls on me and i was holding a camera and it was i was filming it to show him how good his vanish was because he didn't think it was a good vanish um so I'll, I'll see if i can play this video five or six though but five five is fine i i i get her into the uh, get her into uh, sponge balls and the sleight of hand and yeah tell her not to shove it up a jumper that would probably do the best bet I think the most important thing though as and I've said this before if you're teaching kids magic make sure it's fun make sure they're having fun that's the most important thing I've got two balls and you can have this one daddy and I got this and hold this one really 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 tight Open your hand. Whoa! It's America. Next question is from David Blaine, and David says, "Hi, Craig. Are you going to do a five by five with loops, and also the new release premiere? Is it only 
is it only going to be one movie? Yeah, it's only one movie. I'll be doing a review show special on it soon, but it's an amazing trick. 555 five, five with the loops. Absolutely, after the success of the map test with the loops, we're definitely revisiting loops, so that'll be coming soon. Okay, so the next question, again, is from Sean McNulty, Magician, and Sean says, how do you switch off from magic or the magic business? I'm constantly thinking of things I need to do, goals or practice, building the business, etc. and sometimes I feel like I'm overthinking and I'm just focusing on the magic. Any tips? Yeah, um, make sure that you've got enough, to, make sure that you've got time away from magic. Build time in for yourself and your family and things that you really enjoy doing. So I love genre TV. I love wrestling. Um, I really do. I love, uh, I'm currently re-watching all the Red Dwarfs whilst at the same time um, watching Picard. Uh, I'm on season two at the moment, but I've heard season three is amazing. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've just, watched Wrestlemania for example I'm excited about Backlash so I I do a lot of stuff for myself and I do a lot of stuff with my family as well that's got nothing to do with magic and I think you've just got to find time it's very easy to become a workaholic I know I have been and at times I am a workaholic and I have to dial it back and the way that I dial it back is because Sarah gives me a metaphorical slap around the face and says hey you're working too hard um sometimes you just need to switch off right? Sometimes you just need to switch off. Make sure that you've got a hobby or an interest away from magic, something else that you like doing, or at least something different to what you normally do with magic. So for me, to be honest, creating magic is something that's, that's different to running the business and the performing of magic and the running of the agency and stuff like that. But creating magic is something I do because I enjoy doing it. It's fun. The creative process is fun for me. That's why I create magic. And sometimes Sarah will say to me, I'm just sitting there and I'll just zone off and I'll look into space. And she's like, hey, you're thinking about another trick, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, I am. Yeah, in all honesty. Yes, I am. Um, so just, you know, it's very easy. How do you switch off from magic and business? You're constantly thinking of things that you need to do. Yeah, just make sure that you um, watch my video on time management. I think that's important. I think you're on the Netflix. And if you are, go and watch the video on time management. I've got another huge series on time management going up on the Netflix next week. So watch out for that. But yeah, just, just, just make sure you're managing your time effectively. Switch off, have hobbies outside of magic and and, and just remember that you do it because you love it, right? That's important. We've only got one life on this earth. So maximize it, you know, make sure, make make the most of it. Okay, so the next question is from Jean, Jean Volleberg. And Jean says, hi, Craig. My question is the following. I'm asked to perform for the local writer society. And I wanted to do something with books. For an idea that I have, I would like to force a word from the index of a book is there any way other than the number of nine force to force something uh, to force something from the index of a book? I'm not a great fan of the number nine force. Um, to force something from the index of the book. Why would you want to force something from the index of the book? Right. The best book test that you could use is the um, is the impromptu hoy book test that I talked about a few weeks ago on the Q and A. If you missed it. Um, the idea is really simple. You just borrow two books, right? And uh, you, you flick through the books and you go, look, there's a whole bunch of pages in these books. And you pick up the first book and you flick through it as if you're just looking at the pages and you clock a page with a nice big, num uh, a nice big word as the first word on the left-hand page, the very top first word, and you clock what the page number is. You then put that down. You remember the word and you remember the page number. You then pick up the other book and you flick through the same and you just look at it and you're just looking at that book, right? So you just so from their point of view, you've borrowed two books and you just flick through to show that they're all different. You then equivoke or equivocate, depending on your point of view, the the book with the word that you memorized to the spectator. So it's like, I've got two books, which one do you want to do the magic with? And if they say this one, you go, fantastic, you hold on to this one. And if they uh, if they say this one, you say, okay, right, we'll use the magic with this one, you hold on to this one. Either way, they get the book with the word in it that you remembered. You now take the other book and you say to somebody, I'm going to flip through this book, I just want you to say stop anytime you want to. And you time it so they stop you at around about the same page number as the book that you've memorized. Um, so let's say that's page number 106. You flick through and you say, say stop anytime you want to. You go, brilliant. You stopped on page number 106. 
and then you hand the book over to them and you say, right, can you look up 106 for me? Go to page 106 and look at the first word on the page. Remember that word, close the book, and now you can tell them what the word is. So in other words, you're using the second book to force the page number on the book that you gave them, which you know the force word of, right? That's the best way to do a force with two borrowed books. It works very, very easily, and it's completely motivated. Uh, I wouldn't bother with the index, to be honest. I mean, um, if I was going to go and force something off an index, what I'd probably do is I would probably get a pet, get a Sharpie and draw a circle around one of the words in the in the index. And then what I'd do is I'd take a dried out Sharpie and I'd say, hey, we're going to try and do something here, but I went to completely random. We're going to open up the index page, take the pen for me. I'll hold the page open. Can you do me a favor and just make a circle somewhere in the middle of the page? Fantastic. Now, are you around a a, a word you are can you remember that word now the only downside to that is you could doing this in a writer society and it, it might be a bit weird to you know deface a book just in just in order to do a card trick uh, well a, a magic trick but that would effectively force a word on the index really really well as well um yeah other than that look into something like pegasus page because that will allow you to achieve the same thing as well Okay, so the next question is from Lucian Lawson. And this is the last question, not the last one. This is the last question. Lucian says, how do you start gigging? I'm not really old enough to go to a bar and perform. So I'm wondering what other places you can go to to get gigs. Uh, right, let's have a look here. Uncle Joe has replied to you. Uh, and he's got some great advice. So Uncle Joe said, join a magic club in your area uh, and, and network with the magicians there. That's a great idea. Create a name for yourself by volunteering to do magic at various events, such as flea markets, school concerts, restaurants. Uh, you know, that's that's a great idea. Uncle Joe knows. Yeah, just go out there and perform as much as you can. Don't be afraid to do magic for kids. I know you might not want to be a kid's performer, um, but go and do kids shows and, and, and get yourself an act together. Right. One of the big things that I can do, I can suggest is get yourself a really good act together. So Ryland's 10 years old, right? And he's just done the Hey Presto show uh, in front of like 200 people at the Blackpool Magic um, Hey Presto show. Sorry, the Bradford Magic Hey Presto show. Uh, he's been on the Blackpool Magic Convention. He's been on the IBM Convention. Uh, he's been on the... Um, uh, he was booked to do the Christmas party for the Blackpool Magic Club. He's got a whole bunch of other stuff coming up for various different magic conventions and societies. And one of the reasons is he put himself together a really good act the sort of act that magicians would like to see. And because he's got this act, people will book him to do it, right? Get a really good act, a really, really good stage show, uh, performance. Everybody always focuses on close-up magic these days, but get yourself a really good 15-minute stage spot together and then s film it and then send it out to as many people as you can. You know, get on some variety nights, get on some comedy clubs. And you might be too young for comedy clubs, but, you know, show get, get to some magic clubs, all your local magic clubs and say, hey, I'd like to do my stage act for you. Flight time's the most important thing. Don't worry about so much about getting gigs. Get good at performing. Go out and get flight time and then you can go out and get gigs and you're going to be a much better performer. If you want advice on how to actually get gigs outside of that, set up a website, uh, put a blog on it, start writing blogs, put some fantastic videos and some fantastic, fantastic photos on there. That's a great way to go and get gigs. Great way to go and get gigs. But outside of that, just go out and get flight time learn to be the best performer that you can be and then the gigs will start coming so there you go guys that's another q a in the bag thank you once again for joining me right here on magic tv uh let me know what you think in the comments down below do you agree do you disagree i'd like to know your thoughts don't forget you want to see more videos like this like the video subscribe to the channel leave a comment down below and i'm going to be back again um i'm going to be back again very very soon i'm going to be back again um, tomorrow with a bunch more videos. I'm going to be back tonight with a review show special. So look out for all of that. Thank you once again for joining me. Don't forget, if you want to go and check out the Netflix, it's my online streaming platform. And, and honestly, we've just had the Nicholas Mavresis Masterclass. It's brilliant. Uh, we've just uploaded some of my favorite routines with sponge balls. We've got some coin stuff going up next week, some card material. We've got more Justin Miller stuff going up. Honestly, the Netflix is the place to be. You want to go check it out, go to www.net. 
thenetrix.com. Go see all the little fusses about. And I will be back again soon with another video. Thanks for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.